makes a great addition to any adventures and that's either large, medium, or small. So giving uh Neil, help me, please help me! They're, the oh, they're coming! They're coming! Bring out for realms in your area. Don't be discouraged if you can't find Greetings, Larkcraftians. This is our tenant with a, another Lark cast. We're doing video because that's what we do. We do have this also on audio, so if you're listening, thanks for listening. If you're watching, thanks for watching. Kind of running solo on this intro today, but we took a field trip to the Wisconsin Historical Fencing Association last night, and we watched them do some practices. They did some uh, videos with us, and we worked together to try to come up with you know, some kind of collaborative effort between their group and our group. It's very important for groups to work together if we can. And we've worked like this with other groups as well. So it was a really great time. We all kind of, uh, our LARP guys and gals got to see how, you know, their training works and how their competitions work by explanation. They got to see us and how our LARP stuff works. We handed out uh, cards and exchanged information and again did a lot of a lot of cool things together so you're going to be seeing some more videos from actual experts in these fields giving us tips on how we can use them in live action role play and if we want to take them further even outside the game how to get a hold of them and work with the groups that can do that this presentation today has been brought to you by uh, Lord of the Hoodie wearing one of their hoods right now uh, it is a absolutely awesome um, hoodie and has a lot of cool features in it like things for your hands to hold the uh, the, the cuffs has a cool new uh, insignia from last year the actual pockets go all the way up and down the zippers are uh, higher quality than they were last year and it's just it's a really neat uh, really neat fantasy hoodie that gets a lot of attention wherever you go so I'll link their information below and uh, we thank them and again you'll be seeing a lot more of these uh, they've got cloaks and they got hoodies you'll see them in a lot of the stuff that we do we have uh, Aaron coming to us now uh, from the meeting last night he's going to talk about master cuts now while all of these master cuts may not be appropriate for live action role play they are techniques that are historically accurate as well as the names are and can be adapted for live action role play in most cases. Some you may find it rather difficult to do, others um, can be easily adapted. It's very important to realize the difference between what he's going to show you in a moment and what's available and what's possible with live action role play because the difference between a medium or a soft contact LARP is you don't aim for the head or the, uh, the groin in most cases. With medieval uh, historical training documents, most of the shots were for the head or the torso or the open areas to eliminate your opponent because you're not playing, you're actually fighting and you only have very few moments to take out your opponent before they take you out. So that's kind of how we're trying to progress. How do we you know, bridge, because we really want to have that historical accuracy we want to encourage people to, uh, you know, research this stuff and use it in LARP because it really does help bring out more in the LARP from an immersion standpoint when you're using historically accurate um, fighting techniques and, and weaponry techniques for the Miss and Legend systems and other medieval style systems. It also teaches you a lot of control with your weapon, which actually makes you a safer player. So again, we'll show you some, some of the, the cuts that he filmed with us last night, and uh, hope you enjoy it. 
Hi, Aaron Pennerberg. I am the Provost and Lead Instructor here at the Wisconsin Historical Fencing Association Appleton Chapter. Uh, just a little bit about us. Um, I formed uh, the Wisconsin Historical Fencing Association about two years ago. We have several chapters. There's one in Milwaukee. Uh, that's run by Jeremiah Bachhaus, who was my uh, lead apprentice for many years. We also have one in La Crosse, run by uh, Tyler Arndt. And uh, what we're about is historical fighting. Uh, there's an acronym we use that's called HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. And really what's happening is we're taking a look at old manuscripts from the actual time period and we're kind of deconstructing what these manuscripts taught back then. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to use period accurate uh, tools such as this Albion Lichtenauer training sword um, and we're trying to reconstruct what it is they taught and why they taught it. What we're going to do is we're going to show you five basic historically accurate techniques that they taught in these manuscripts, show you what they are, show you what they're for, and kind of describe a little bit about their utility and development. That'll be next. Okay, this is going to be the first technique of the five basic master cuts. They call them the master cuts because these particular techniques, these particular tactics, are exceptionally useful in sword combat. I'm going to demonstrate for you why that is in just a second. Now the terms I'm going to use are Swabian, or basically ancient German. I'll describe the German name and then I'll describe what it means in English. The first one that I'm going to show you is called the Sverkau. And what the Sverkau means is the cross cut. The cross cut is a horizontal cut which basically defeats all incoming cuts vertically. We'll show that to you now. Here we go. Okay, so what happened was Ben threw a vertical, what's called an uberhau, or an overcut, at my head. What I did with this sword is I simply turned my palm like this and intercepted his cut with what we call the short edge. There's two edges on this sword. They're both used for different things. I don't bash one edge up and then flip it around and use the other edge, okay? It's used in specific ways. What happens is I intercept that cut with the short edge or the back edge by flipping my sword around just like this as that cut comes in. And what happens is, can you go real slow? What happens is he throws that cut and I go like so, is I hit him right upside the head, block his incoming cut with my cross. That's a perfect, beautiful way in which to intercept a blow of that type. Let's see it again. Smirk out, cut. There it is, right in line with his face. There are two modes to each of these cuts, and it's interesting because they're used in different ways. The first mode is just as I described a minute ago, where I'm actually looking to cut upside his head at the same time. The other mode is where I'm looking to put my point directly in front of his face. And the reason why I do that is to threaten a thrust. Let's take a look at that two mode system in just one second. Here we go. Okay, cut. So there, you can see my point is aligned right in front of his face. But what I'm doing is I'm threatening that thrust. If he does nothing, I will thrust him right in the face. But no one's going to sit there and do nothing. Most people react by defending and pushing my sword up. I know that's going to happen, and then I defeat that by doing something like that. So it's kind of setting up the next cut knowing that when I cut back at him to defend myself, he's also going to defend himself. So, it's kind of interesting from that standpoint. Now, let's look at the second cut. This one is called the shield howl, or the squinter cut. It's also a cut with the back edge of the sword, not the lead edge, the back edge. So here's that cut, the shield howl, the squinter. Cut. Three. So what happens here is I use my back edge to displace and then cut him right on top of the head just like so. Let's see it one more time. This shield how. Cut. And again, coming right down on top of his face. This is a nice cut for those persons that try and overpower you or try and hit you really hard with an uber how and overcut. Because it displaces it displaces that energy and shoots it off to the side. Let's see it real slow. So it's coming, I'm going to turn my hilt like so, accept the cut there, and then hit him just like that. The shield howl, the swinter. Okay? 
Okay, the next cut we're going to talk about in these five master cuts is called the Zornhau, or the cut of wrath. It's also kind of called a wrathful cut or a wrathful attitude because what I'm doing basically is mimicking my enemy. Generally, someone who's untrained in sword arts, but someone who's under attack or attacking you, they're generally going to deliver this overhand, over shoulder kind of baseball bat like swing of a cut for a lot of reasons. Because, you know, emotionally they're worked up, they want to try and harm you, and that's kind of the most natural thing to do with a sword in your hand is kind of do this overhead swing kind of thing. And in the manuscripts, it's interesting because back then, like in the 1100s, they identified this cut as what they describe as a bad peasant blow. And what that means generally is that people that are untrained, unskilled, unaware of these combative principles, they're going to come at you with this kind of berserker kind of cut. And this is the way they teach you to displace it. In this cut, I'm not trying to cut her like I did before in that second kind of mode where I'm trying to make contact with her mask. Instead, I'm trying to lay my point right in front of her face, just like so, as I displace that big, huge haymaker cut coming in. It's interesting because I think they identified that that kind of fighter, that kind of ruffian, is not really aware of range and distance. And they have a tendency to cut short. So, in order to deal with that, I bring my sword in front of me a little tighter, a little closer, to protect my arms, my hands, my fingers from that kind of crazy, bleh, berserker kind of blow. So let's see how that looks like. So Danielle's going to go ahead and cut at me. Cut. And there it is, just like so. So she throws kind of a wild, crazy, angled cut at me, and I displace it just like this, laying that point right into her face just like that. Let's see it again. Now this is different from the other two blows that I showed you because it's using the long edge. I want the long edge for this particular cut because I want the power displacement that I'm going to need for that kind of energy coming at me. So let's see it one more time. Go ahead and cut. Yeah, there it is, just like that. You'll notice as well my cross guard is very active in this cut because there's kind of some slapping and displacement that's going on. So when you grab a hilt, a medieval hilt of a sword, my grip changes dynamically depending upon what's happening along the trajectory that she's throwing her cut. In other words, I don't grasp my sword and hold my hands just like this no matter what's happening. In fact, the dexterity, the manual dexterity of my thumb, my finger over the top, my finger grips on the corded grip itself are extremely important and can't be understated. Let's see if we can show that one more time and I'll try and describe that a bit. So I have my sword grasp in a normal grip. She cuts. Yeah. And I had to throw my lead hand back just a little bit and angle my cross in such a way that it'll protect me. Pulling my fingers back away from it a bit. It just makes good common sense. I don't want to leave my fingers all tight up in here to get kind of slapped around in, in that kind of moment. So I hope that makes sense. So, so far three cuts have been described for you. The Zornhau, the Cut of Wrath, the Shielhau, the Swinter Cut, and the Swerkhau, or the Cross Cut. All of these cuts deal with Uberhaus, or blows coming from above. I'll tell you why in just a second. Okay, hi. Uh, so the next cut is going to be the Scheidelhau, okay? And what that means is Scalp Cut. It's still dealing with the, the overhand blow, the Uberhau, that's coming in directed from above. What I'm going to do now, though, is I'm looking to aim to put my long edge directly on top of the fighter's head as that blow comes in. So again, here we go. Cut. And good. Now, in this case, I didn't put my sword here where kind of they advise. I did put it here. What I have discovered about this is that by putting it here, I protect myself easier and better. It threatens the thrust as the other cuts have been advised through uh, the manuscripts, but in this cut it doesn't really talk about that a whole lot. So I'm going to try and aim for her head again, try and get that technique right. So here we go. Cut. Better. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Right on top of her head, I want that long edge cutting right down into her as she's cutting at me. Notice again, let's do it one more time. Notice again how I have to really measure, I have to be careful with my hands on this grip. It's not a static grip where I hold it the same throughout the entire cut. I'm changing my grip depending upon the trajectory that's, that I need, okay, and the prerequisite power. Okay. Cut. Ah, oh, there we go, that was nice. Right on top. Good. The Scheidel Howl, the Scalp Cut.
Thank you, Katie. All right, so the last cut in this series of five master cuts, this kind of turns the whole system I just described, that of master cutting those Uberhau, displacing those incoming cuts with cuts of my own that stifle and stop his attack and then threaten the thrust or actually cut him on the way as he delivers those cuts in. This system, called the Krumpau, the crooked cuts, turns that idea on its head. What happens is instead of cutting back at him, I'm going to cut crosswise against his sword, which is something the masters usually advise against. I never, ever, ever want to cut into his weapon. I don't care about his weapon when I fight him, I'm fighting the person. So I'm always attempting to fight the person and not the sword. We'll talk about that in our other practice, but here is the Krumpau in its basic form. All right? Cut. What happens is, it is a short edge displacement. It can be a long edge displacement too, and I'll show that next. But for now, it's a short edge displacement with my wrists crossed and high. This cross guard is protecting me in case he throws that cut in at my head, as he should. And then I have tons of options with which to offend him. The first one being my long edge, right back into his head. So let's do that a little smoothly. We'll show you that displacement and counter cut. Cut. And there's the cut in return. Now let me show you the long edge displacement, Krumpau. Cut. And cut right back at him. Now one thing I didn't show, I cut right here. The Krumpau really is meant to attack the hands. And it's kind of unique because it's the only cut we have really in our tradition, which specifically says cut the guy's hands. The other ones are all at the face and torso, generally called the openings. So that is the Krumpau, or the crooked cut. We're going to show one more thing. The European sword, the sharpness of the sword. Realize sharpness is a subjective term. What I think might be sharp and what Katie thinks might be sharp are two different things. It's not a scientific term. The sharpness of a European sword differed along the length of the blade. The things over here, about this distance, were very, very sharp, this part of the sword. Because as you noticed before when I was doing those master cuts, that's the part of the sword that actually makes contact with my opponent. The rest of the sword is displacing the incoming blow and delivering this portion of the sword to my opponent. So this part is very sharp. Now with sharpness comes brittleness. So even though that's very sharp, the rest of it would not be as sharp and it would let me do things such as this, called half sorting, or the half schwart. <clears throat> so what happens is, as I displace, I can grab onto my own blade and do things from there, such as ring and arm schwart or other displacements. Let's see it again. Okay? Cut. So, I catch my own blade, I displace her weapon. Now from here, there's a whole bunch of things I can do. And that's part of our arts, but my favorite thing to do is just crack that weapon down with the cross and then deliver that point in. So let's see that one more time. Cut. And there's that. In addition, this is where our ring and arm squirt comes into play. Cut. So what happens is I can brace that weapon up against myself. She's going to hit the steel. She might hit my shoulder a bit. But it's not going to cut enough to hurt me. It's going to hit that steel. And then I can place that down and hit her. Here's another type of idea. Cut. Grabbing her weapon. From that half sword, I can come in, grab her weapon. Now she's stuck in there. Now I can do a whole bunch of cool stuff like grab her, put my cross in here, take her down, hit her with my own weapon on her neck. Etc, etc, etc. You'll see some of that later on. But that's kind of the idea. The sword is not one uniform sharpness. It's different sections, different pieces of the sword doing different things. Thanks. So again, great folks. Uh, Aaron, who leads the Appleton chapter, does a really great job with videos. We're going to do more videos with them because it helps both organizations and we want to, you know, help grow their memberships. Again, physical fitness, all that type of training really, really helps with live action role play and we could do a lot of stuff together which is just excellent. If you are doing a LARP, whether it's in LARPcraft or not, 
it's always to your advantage to try to look and see what other LARP groups are in the area. So if you have a specific LARP you're in, you may be able to collaborate ideas or you know, not have to host stuff all the time if you're hosting them by going to other people's LARPs. And in our opinion, you really can't have a really good LARP unless you go to a lot of other LARPs and kind of see what works and what doesn't for your area. Because all players are different, continents are different, people are different, so you got to see what works and the people tell you that. So, not to mention, you really don't want to step on each other's toes, you don't want to make enemies. We want to try to work together as a LARP community and, you know, not step on each other's toes and really try to encourage uh, camaraderie and working together. So, it, it's, a, it's a very important thing. So, um, yeah, the, the trip last night was amazing. It was just absolutely amazing. And if we could have, you know, some of those folks at our games to either participate or if they just want to do some weapons training or uh, physical fitness stuff or anything they'd want to do, I could easily see putting those types of uh, trained professionals at like a barracks and they would be teaching uh, techniques that would be appropriate in-game at that time. So, we, you know, we would have to go through and, and see what would be available. But... You know, some of the things that also came up in things like this, it's always a little scary showing headshots and that kind of stuff with LARP because you don't want to give the wrong impression. But you also don't want to take away from a lot of the realism as well. You'll maybe notice in the Myths and Legends uh, rulebook that we put in a lot more with helms and safety gear and eye protection because even if you don't, you know, our LARP doesn't allow you to hit in the head with normal players. So... But it, it happens. I mean, shield glances, blows to the stuff. I mean, arrows flying. You got stuff happening. So, you know, you got to actually have that kind of protection, and that is really, really essential. And speaking of like weapons that you can throw, Live Action Products now has a four point star that is actually flyable. It actually works. This is not even out of the uh, out of the gate yet. I don't even think you can. You can't even buy these yet at the time of this filming. You probably can if you've waited a while. But um, this weapon is really cool. And historically you really don't have a lot of uh, LARP projectile weapons that feel good, aim well, and perform well. Because you're dealing with a foam. So uh, sure not all foams are the same, but foam is foam. It's usually pretty lightweight and it's hard to actually make it go where you want it to go. So we've seen some of the stars and stuff from other manufacturers, and they just don't fly. Um, the, some of them from some manufacturers fly really well, and then we found out that in the middle there's like a washer. They don't really say some of that stuff, so that was kind of crappy. But I understand why they do it, because there's really no way to get even at the washer. Uh, but most rulebooks say that you can't have a core in a, in a, in a something that you're going to throw. So uh, this is definitely coreless. And it's very soft foam, but it has, you can see it's actually fatter in the middle. And it is really easy to grip and throw. Not to mention it has a hole in the middle, so you can put it in your, you know, you can wrap it in stuff or carry it on a loop of some sort. Uh, very, very cool. And from live action products, uh, really great stuff. So if you get a chance when this becomes available, you're going to want to check it out. Uh, flies really, really well. And the uh, control is really important. It's got enough weight to actually make it worthwhile. Uh, it's definitely under the rulebook weight limits. I think it's like an ounce or two. But the way it's designed is really, really cool. So check it out when you get a chance. Live action products. And yeah, so they are, you know, we're, we're kind of getting ready here for um, spring. And people are prepping. You can tell that the cabin fever fever is a, is upon the northern hemisphere um, LARP groups. Uh, our Australian friends are experiencing their summer and stuff right now. So we, you know, uh, it's kind of neat to see all the different seasons and all the different parts of the globe with LARP craft. Let's see what else is new today. Oh, the Genesis system. We released a um, teaser trailer for the Genesis system. So if you go to GenesisLARP.com or the Genesis page within the um, 
larpcraft.com. You can actually see that teaser. It doesn't really say much. It just basically set, you know, shows the logo and what we're going to be doing. The forums are up. The tracking system is up. And the um, community group, the actual LARPcraft community uh, Genesis system group is up. So you can ask questions without making a profile or a character because you don't know how it works yet. And that will be, um, you know, that would be something you could do if you wanted to do it. It's time travel LARP. I guess I should probably explain it, what it is. The time travel LARP is really unique in that it allows us to bring all of our systems together. So you have, you know, Wild West, Myths and Legends, you have Galactic LARP, and you have, um, why am I blanking on this? All the LARPs can go in the one place in Genesis. So if you have like a, it's a time dimensional, you know, uh, the event will be ho be held in a certain dimension. So the, the promoter or the, the colony will set the time frame. Uh, and then all those characters can come in from other dimensions and, and basically LARP systems and, and actually experience all the stuff. So, you know, Risen or Galactic or Wild West or um, the Myths and Legends, all of those creatures can interact together, which, you know, wouldn't be possible without this. You would bring your character sheets in from the game system that you're part of. So Genesis really doesn't have its own uh, races and classes. It's coming in from all the other races and classes. But it gives you a way to bring your favorite character to a game where other favorite characters from other systems can also react and interact. So it's a very unique, uh, unique thing. And we had to bring it up to speed because there was a... Uh, uh, some interest in some other groups that wanted to help do some of this stuff so we kind of had to jump start Genesis get the system all put together and then start framing the other systems because you got to have all the other systems active before Genesis really makes you know full impact but even if you just had two like Risen and and Missing Legends you could actually have those two together in a Genesis game so it's a neat way to bridge characters and bridge systems and we're really excited to, to have that come together. So if you get a chance, check out Genesis, uh, the Genesis system on Facebook, Twitter. Um, all that stuff is posted on LARPcraft.com under the Genesis system. And uh, let us know what you think as we, as we bring, it, bring it together. That's all the time we have for this LARPcast. We hope to see you again or hear from you again. Check us out on the East Coast Podcast Network as well as LARPcast.com and other social network sites that pick us up. We'll see you in the games. Thanks for watching and listening.